Well, my next guest is one of the biggest names in Australian theatre. Since making his debut in the role of Oliver at the age of 10, Tony Sheldon has appeared in a wide array of productions, everything from Shakespeare and Chekhov to popular musicals. He's won national awards for his work in shows like The Producers and The Witches of Eastwick. He's also a playwright and a screenwriter for some of Australia's best-loved soap operas. And now Tony Sheldon is starring in the stage musical version of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. In fact, he's been starring in the stage play since it began in Australia in 2006. The play is based on the 1994 film, the story of three drag performers making their way across the Australian outback for a gig in the remote town of Alice Springs. Tony is reprising his role as Bernadette on stage in Toronto right now to rave reviews, and soon he'll be packing up the pink bus and heading to New York to play her on Broadway. But first... Tony Sheldon joins me in studio. Q, hello, sir. Hello, Jean. What a nice good. smile you have on your face. Well, I'm, 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 I'm hearing that music for the first time in a couple of years. I haven't heard the album in such a long time. I thought, oh, is that what it sounds like? <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> You're fond of it. You enjoy hearing it. Look, I love the show. It's still a joy. I've, four years ago, I started this project, and I race out the door to go to work every night. It's... Uh, it's a very unusual thing to to be so in love with the show, but I've I've had a lot of involvement in it since the beginning. I've been allowed to contribute to the script, and uh, I've I've had a, a sort of a key input in it since the beginning. So it's it's a very personal project. For You're me. one of the best known stage actors in your home country. What's it like playing this very Australian role in a very Australian play or musical to North American audiences? It's the fulfillment of a dream. It's one of those things you never think is ever going to happen, that you're going to travel with an Australian role in an Australian written show and to go possibly to Broadway with it. (laughs) And a musical. I grew up in a musical comedy family. My father was a dancer. My mother is still a musical theatre star in Australia. Um, In her 80s or 70s? uh, She's 78. Right, Yeah. yeah. My grandparents were vaudevillians. Uh, my aunt is Helen Reddy, who wrote I Am Woman. And uh, <laughs> I, I'd sort of given up on the idea that I was going to, to ever leave Australia with a show. Once I sort of hit my 50s, I thought, no, this is it. I'm quite happy doing what I'm doing. I'm playing the sort of roles that I like and I'm getting the work that I like. And for this to come along at this point in my career... Uh, it's uh, it was just not on my radar, so boy, am I enjoying it. But see now, and I've been talking on the show about how much I, I, I love this musical. It's it's so well done, and 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 s- people are having so much fun uh, attending it, and the rave reviews, of course. Now it all makes sense, of course. Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, on the stage, but it's set in the Australian outback. It's essentially uh, takes place with a bus, a big bus. And it is particularly Australian in its tone and content. How did you know from the beginning or that this would work on stage? Well, of course we didn't. Uh, the, the big thing being that have you, there is no desert to put on stage. So, so what, what do you substitute? And in the workshop, the, we had to ask those big questions, the, the main one being... Um, do we commission an original score because a new musical, that's what you do? Or do we use the music from the film, which has now become iconic? Yeah. I love the nightlife and I will survive and risk being labelled yet another jukebox musical. And we decided that if we went with an original score and the, pe- the public didn't like it, we, we could close in two weeks. <laughs> if we went with that music that people knew, we at least knew we'd we'd get a response of some sort from the audience. So that was the main thing. And then deciding to replace the desert by making the music into a sort of a fantasy version of the desert, a sort of a Ziegfeld Follies version of the desert. So we didn't have the, the expanse of the sand and the sky, but we used the music to turn the show into into a spectacular review, basically. Let me come back to the jukebox musical thing in a, in a bit. But, for, but first, I mean, Priscilla is resonating in such a broad way uh, a Broadway, if you will. <laughs> how how does a story about three drag queens in the desert become universal? Because drag queens are misfits, and uh, they they are frowned upon by a large section of society, and uh, also the road movie in itself is a wonderful genre because simply by the structure 
of it brings a different location and a different set of characters in every single the, scene. The Little Prince. It's The yeah, Little Prince. Yeah. It's, it's Enid Blyton's The Faraway Tree of, mm-hmm. of a different land mm-hmm. appears at the top of the tree and the kids climb the tree not knowing what's going to be up mm-hmm. there every day. Uh, so it's, it's that structure. And you take three fish out of water who mm-hmm. really shouldn't be there mm-hmm. and they also shouldn't be together because they don't especially get on, these three people. Uh, and you send them out into some weird hostile environment. It's 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 alien. It's 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 every story. Uh, it, they just happen to be three drag queens. And, and what about Bernadette? I mean, what is it about your character specifically, a middle-aged transsexual woman, that people find so human and relatable? Because you really are. People adore Bernadette. At least they did in the audience that when I was watching the show. Why why do you think that is? Well, I think she's come a long way in her life. She's she's lived many lives. Uh, she was a big star in her time in the 1960s. Uh, she was also a, a revolutionary in that she she was one of the first um, sex changes, public sex changes, and. Uh, Lay Girls, the club where Bernadette worked, is a real club in Sydney. Mm. And in the, um, excuse me, during the Vietnam War, uh, all the American soldiers used to come to town and they'd all go to Lay Girls. That was what they did because they had the prettiest chicks in town mm. were, were performing, except they were mostly guys. Um, and so she was leading a champagne and, and caviar existence for many years. Now that's all passed her by. She's she's in middle age and she's a widow her boyfriend has di- has died at the top of the show so we see we meet her at a very vulnerable point when she more or less has no future and she goes off on this journey simply because there's nothing else for her to do and uh, but all the different facets of her are revealed on the journey because we realize that she's a tough cookie she's a mother she's very motherly towards the other two younger guys uh, she is a survivor she's a romantic uh, so I think she's she's every woman. I think she is revealed as it's that maternal quality. I think, uh, coupled with the the glamour and the sense of humour. She's 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 funny. So hmm. it's uh, as friends of mine said. You realise this is your hello dolly. This is well, your main. Well, she is <laughs> she is also you. Yeah, and 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 you are have become uh, celebrated doing her uh, being Bernadette. And w- what's interesting about that partly is that. You had some concern about playing this role. It didn't. You, it, you didn't jump at the opportunity when it was first offer, offered to you. No. Why not? Well, because uh, I think, like in any show business community, Australians have a very short memory, and they only remember you from your last gig. And my last gig before I did this was the producers, in which I was playing Roger Debris, and I came out in that twenty-five thousand dollar dress, looking like the Chrysler Building. Now, I only wore that for 20 minutes. For the rest of the show, I was dressed as Hitler. I was dressed as a lot of other things. But I was front page news in that dress. Mm. And that was all anybody talked about. And I did the show for two years. And then somebody said, oh, hey, they're doing a workshop of this musical Priscilla. And I said, I would rather stick a needle in my eye than put on another frock. You are worried about being typecast. Yeah, yeah, because I thought that'll be it. Even I, given all that you've done. Yeah, you? because people don't remember all that stuff they just think oh that's all he plays what Uh, changed your mind i did the workshop and i slept in it was the middle of summer i had a full beard i (laughs) i was wearing shorts and uh sandals and we did the entire show No, no costumes or anything but we did the entire show for the producers and i saw the response that everybody believed me everybody believed that Mm. i was playing this character even though i didn't look like her Mm. and i thought I've nailed something here, and this is going to be a challenge. This is really going to be a challenge because she's not a drag role. It's a woman. I've got to play her as a woman, somebody who has lived her whole life as a woman and thinks like a woman. So I thought, okay, this is this is the challenge of my career now. I've got to, if I can pull this one off, this is going to be a real achievement. People adore the musical. They adored the film. You didn't when you first saw the film. Why not? I saw it. Sadly, hot on the heels of another film called Muriel's Wedding, yes, which I just thought was one of the great Australian movies. And then uh, literally five days later, I saw Priscilla and I found it just a bit vulgar, I think, mm. a bit trashy. And I, I did, didn't lock into it uh, as 
I didn't lock into the humour at the time. It took me many, many years to to see it again because because of having grown up with those people from Lay Girls, with having known them socially through my family, um, and they were the the glamour pussies. You felt like it was a caricature. I I just thought it was about people who I didn't particularly care to spend two hours of my life with, basically. Um, and uh, I was being a snob about mm. it. Do and, you worry that people would have ever have that opinion now? Well, people do. It's very hard to get people in the door to see Priscilla because they think, oh, it's a poof to show. Uh, what we have to convince them is that uh, we thrive on their low expectations because once we've got them in the door, they, they don't know what a good time they're going to have. You think even now it's hard to get Priscilla people to, to see the show? Of course it is. People, people are uh, a very large percentage of the public is, is homophobic. And uh, especially in this time and day and age when people are saying, oh, please, do we have to keep hearing about gay rights and gay marriage? Mm -hmm. And so people actually are reluctant to come and see it unless they're open-minded or or they just love musicals. Um, So, yeah, yeah, it's a battle. And and we we are winning this battle because a, a large part of our audience are women. I would say probably most of our audience are women. And they come and they have the bestest time. And they're um, our repeat audience. And they come and they bring their husbands and they bring their kids. And then the husbands realise what a great show it is. In the film version, Bernadette is played by British actor Terence Stamp. You've taken quite a different approach to the character than he did. How would you describe the differences and why? Um, Terence Stamp came to Australia to publicise the musical and before he'd even seen it. We were there doing photo opportunities, you know, him <laughs> symbolically handing over a sequined stiletto <laughs> shoe to me on stage. Right, right. Uh, the handing over the of the handing sequined over, shoe. Yeah. All of that, yes. <laughs> and uh, he, he was standing next to me when um, a member of the press asked him about his take on Bernadette, and he said, I was playing a woman who was... Uh, desperately unhappy to be trapped in the wrong body all her life. I was playing the agony of a woman mm. trapped in the wrong body. And I, a little bell went off in my head and I thought, oh, yes, it was a rather gloomy performance, I thought. Uh, and that was what that was the choice that he made. Uh, whereas I chose to play the, the party girl, the woman who actually fulfilled her dreams. Uh, the only opportunity for a transsexual of that time to to lead a successful life was to be on the stage in a in a show and uh, she there she was she achieved stardom she lived the the life that she set out to to she lived the dream so i thought this is not an unhappy woman this is mm. this is a woman who got exactly what she wanted uh, having said that bernadette and her friends face bigotry and bullying on their road trip on the in this story and priscilla and it's an issue that's very much in the news right now with the recent suicides of gay teenagers. To what extent do you see Bernadette as a role model? Well, I think because she's, as I say, she's she's living the life that she the, the sheer bravery of being able to to live openly as a woman in a time when it was illegal for men to even wear women's underwear under a man's suit. If you were arrested for, say, a drunk driving or something, and they found out that you were wearing frilly knickers underneath your suit... Big trouble. Big trouble. You could be put away. And uh, so here was a woman who openly went out and had a sex change and was probably bashed by the cops anyway simply because she was different... Um, and has survived it and come out of it with grace and integrity. Uh, I think anybody who can stand up for themselves and and show their true colours, to quote one of the songs in the mm. in the show, and uh, can can get past the bigotry to to live an open and fulfilled life, which is all anybody wants to do to be to be themselves and to live happily and to, to be accepted and not judged. So I um, I think she's a she's a terrific. Role model. You and the cast of Priscilla have recorded an It Gets Better message, right? A, a video, a, a, an anti-bullying message. Yeah. What What was your specific message and how do you personally come to that? Well, um, apart from the fact that I was, I was bullied for the reasons that I was a fat kid, uh, I wasn't uh, a sport, sporty kid, and uh, I came 
from a family that was perceived to be unusual in that they were in show business and that they were on TV every night. And so I was pretty much hated for that because kids just you know have a preconceived idea of you and you know oh you you think you're so good well I certainly didn't I was fat and ugly why would I think I was so good um but the other thing was my father committed suicide when I was 10 Mm, and uh, a whole part of this it gets better campaign is to prevent teen suicides my father killed himself when he was 39 um simply because his marriage was in trouble and uh to, to, to reach a point where you think, oh, I cannot get past this obstacle and just kill yourself, it, it totally destroyed my mother and I. And it took us decades to get past the guilt and the, the if onlys. And I felt that if I could say something to kids of, you know, it, please don't take that step because, you know, A, you will get past this, but B, the devastation that it will cause to those around you um, is incalculable. Let me stay on this, Tony. I mean, the, the show is obviously a lot of fun and entertainment, but there are serious issues explored in and around Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. Some critics have pointed out that there is there's plenty of innuendo in Priscilla, but there's no displays of physical intimacy between, say, Bernadette and her love interest, Bob the Mechanic. What do you say to those who complain that the, complain that the show shies away from its gay content? But it was never part of the story. I mean, apart from the fact that Bob is married. That's the thing. That's why there's no kissing between him and Bernadette. Bob's a married man, and Bernadette respects that. And we see their relationship in its infancy when they're still talking to each other they're getting to know each other so it's not shying away from anything it's just not part of the story it's just not part of the story um tick the other central character doesn't have a love interest and uh adam the third one who's the stupid one who just goes out and tries to pick up opal miners you know in a drunken stupor and then nearly gets killed for it nobody's in a situation where they're showing sort of lust or affection for anybody that would require um, kissing or anything. I I think uh, Bob gives Bernadette an enormous hug at one point, but that's as far as their relationship has progressed. Do you feel like the show shies away in any ways? I mean, the the point has also been made that uh, there's uh, there's important tone and, and serious questions and dark moments that are explored throughout the show, but but always pulled away from and pulled out of by some snappy musical number that let's go into Go West by the the village people uh, that people will recognize. Is there a a focus on keeping the tone light that you feel compromises anything in terms of messaging? Um, No, I don't think it compromises it. I mean, we're not stupid. Uh, As I said, the show, the film itself was, was very close to the knuckle, I thought. Um, to the point of, of bordering on the offensive. Now, we, we didn't want to put that on stage and alienate half of the audience. I mean, it's all well and good for the people who saw the film to say, oh, well, Adam in the film uses drugs a lot. Why mm. isn't that in the show? Mm. Um, well, because wh- why would we put it there if it absolutely isn't a- totally necessary? We, we get the point across um, that he's a party boy who does stupid things. Um, we, we are trying to bring in a much more mainstream audience. We're trying to to make the, the show far more visible than the film ever was. And uh, so we're not going to shoot ourselves in the foot by alienating the audience as soon as they get in there. I think the show is is still rougher than anything that's on Broadway. This ain't La Cage au Fol. No. This ain't Mamma Mia. It's got a unique Australian roughness about it. And uh, the language is, is still pretty you know it's out there um so we're 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 making the point i think without driving people out of the theater and you know we'd just be silly it's not mamma mia but it is a jukebox music jukebox musical it is a jukebox you know musical. and you, as you say earlier in the interview and it, and and that it's it sort of gets lumped in with the, the mamma mia or the jersey boys and 
as you know, that's not everybody's cup of tea or, or the complaint from, it's interesting talking to you about this because I know not only have you done a lot of theater and, and musical theater and do you come from that tradition, but you've taught it too. I mean, you're a scholar of this stuff. What do you make of the criticisms that this kind of jukebox musical, Stephen Sondheim was on the show last Friday and he said, I lament the Mamma Mia's because they crowd out new musicals and innovative new stuff from getting on Broadway, say. I agree. I absolutely agree. Um, but I do think that this is uh, a phase that that uh, the theatre is going through. It's it's a sad fact of life now that producers need to have a brand name of some sort. The pre-sold show. And uh, whether it be a title, this is why we're getting this rash of, of shows that are being based on films, mm. or they cast a musical with somebody from the television. Mm. Um, they've got to get the audience in because tickets now are 125 bucks or something, if not more. And even Sondheim himself, he's got a theatre that has opened in his name, the Stephen Sondheim Theatre. What's the first show in there? Pee Wee Herman. Mm. Now, as he said, it ain't exactly a brand new musical, but it's a name. He said it's a jukebox name. It's a... It's a it's a person that everybody remembers from their childhood. Right. It's, it's so even his own theatre, he admits that this is this is how the economy works these days. The trick is to do it well and with integrity. I've seen shows um, I've, that have had original scores that I think were put on for the most cynical reasons. Um, I didn't uh, especially enjoy the musical Footloose because <laughs> I thought that was a case of, oh, let's just take a famous film and we'll just add songs to it. Well, I thought it was creatively the cupboard was bare on right, that one. Right. Um, but with our show, it's important to remember that it's about drag queens who mime. They, they make their living miming to records. And these are people who have spent their entire life in their living rooms singing into their hairbrushes, uh, miming to the Supremes and, and all that. So it makes perfect sense that all the songs are songs that people know and are famous pop hits. It, it actually wouldn't have the same heft if they were singing songs that nobody had ever heard before, no matter how brilliant the score, it actually wouldn't have the resonance. So I think this is an example of a jukebox musical where it's perfectly apt and perfectly right. I love seeing the passion you have, uh, not just for the show, but for Bernadette. You've been doing this since 2006, playing this role. Over a thousand, well over a thousand performances. No end in sight. In fact, you're taking it to Broadway. Australia, the UK, Toronto, and then Broadway. How do you keep this passion so bright when we see you on stage for your character, for Bernadette? Look, I think it's, it's, it came at the right time of my career that I had the discipline and I had the focus and I know how to sustain a long run. I think probably if I'd been younger, I, I might have been defeated by it. I've seen younger people who've done the show who have been defeated by the, the pace of it and the requirements of it. And it's, how do you get defeated? You just get well, exhausted? Well, it's, 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 it's physically terribly hard. You're, you're wearing... The, the costumes are so witty and so funny, and, of course, they won the Oscar for the, for the, for the film, but they're impossible to wear and to <laughs> dance in, and you're wearing things like high-heeled flippers, and, uh, you know, you're wearing shoes that are six times the size of your feet, and you're required to run in them. So it's making your body do very peculiar and unnatural things. And it all happens in your spine and your legs. So you're in pain a great deal of the time. Mm -hmm. I'm also in a corset, which means I can't breathe um, for three and a half hours a night. And uh, You're making a great case for why you shouldn't be doing this. Exactly. But, but exactly. You, but, but you well, what, what I'm saying is I think that I'm at an age now where I can be stoic about it and tolerant <laughs> of it. And, and I learn how that I don't go out after the show and I don't don't go partying with the kids. And on my day off, I do lie like a lummox on, an, on a mattress and, you know, all of those things. And also, I, I love the show and I love going on the journey every night. It's that, that road movie thing of if I don't project where the evening is going to take me and I literally stay in the moment scene by scene, it can all come as a surprise to me too. And the audience dictates how different the show's going to be every night. And also working with different casts. I've had a different group. I'm the only person who's done this show for this yeah. long. So I'm working with all these different actors, all of whom bring something new to the table. It's such a great pleasure to talk to you. Has anything surprised you about 
Toronto or Canada or Canadian audiences? Has anything been particularly different that you didn't anticipate? I think it's always the the shock that people love it as much as they do. And there's always the doubt, especially coming to a new country, this is going to be the one where they're, they're just going to sit and stare at us. And on the first preview, the roar that went up within the first five minutes, it was a wall of, of cheering mm. and excitement. I thought this maybe even tops London and Australia and New Zealand. I didn't think anything could. We're also a colony, you know. So, <laughs> so maybe we, you know, we, we're, we're surrogate Australians. We That's get what it, it is. We get it. That's what it is. Uh, it's, it's, it, thank you so much for making the time. Best of luck on Broadway. Thank and you. I, I, it, it seems hard to conceive that this would be anything other than a smash in Broadway as well. It's done so well in, in the rest of the world. But uh, you're at the forefront, and, and uh, it's been a great pleasure getting to talk to you. Thank you so much. That's Australian actor Tony Sheldon. He appears in the musical version of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, on stage in Toronto at the Princess of Wales Theatre, and opening on Broadway soon. Tony Sheldon has been with me here live in Studio Q.